Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person. I've been asked to talk about narrative theology, and so I thought I'd do it as a story uh, in terms of my experience of narrative theology. Uh, and it began in 1989, uh, 1989, that's right, uh, when I heard a, a preacher in Edinburgh, just a very small church on a housing estate, talk about having read this book here. It's a book you'll find it very difficult to track down. I think it went out of print in the late 80s, uh, but I've got a treasured copy. And there's one chapter in this book, Congregation Stories and Structures by James Hopewell, that really captured my imagination. And what he does in that chapter is he talks about an essay that's in this book, Anatomy of Criticism, by the Canadian literary critic Northrop Fry. It was written, I think, in 1958. Uh, and what Northrop Fry talks about, and adapted by James Hopewell, is four kinds of stories. What Northrop Fry is saying is there are really just four kinds of stories, and he arranges them as a circle. And he arranges them as a circle, and it's nice and easy to remember because he calls them spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And the story that he calls spring is what we would usually call a comedy. And in a comedy, uh, what you find is that there is a problem, but it's a problem not of fundamental perversity or sin, but that centres around lack of information, often mixing up two characters. So if you think about Shakespeare play, there's often twins and they get separated early in their life and they get up to all sorts of adventures because they don't realise they're related to each other. Eventually it becomes clear that they are related to each other and all is resolved and everyone gets married at the end. And that's the classic shape of a comedy. Two thirds or three quarters of the way through the story, a vital piece of information, for example, that these two people are actually twins, comes to light and resolves all the issues going on in the story. And then the, the story of summer is what Fry calls romance. And in a romance, there are often um, three challenges. The, the, the romance is like threes, and the hero has to overcome three challenges in order finally to achieve the goal. So a, a book like The Hobbit is a classic romance because it has um, three major challenges, uh, the, the last one usually being the big one. And one of the phrases that has most stuck with me from Northrop Fry is, in a romance, no one ever pays for the hero's accommodation. It's a wonderful way of saying romance lives on a sort of an external, a higher plane. It doesn't get involved with the details of payment for a hotel room or something like that. It's, it's on a much more mystical plane. And then the third one, the, uh, the story of autumn, is tragedy. Tragedy is the opposite, if you see, across the circle of comedy. In tragedy, there are just givens, uh, the gods, if you like, in a, in, a, in a Greek tragedy. If you contravene an eternal law, uh, then you are doomed and you, uh, you know, if in hubris you think you're outside or above the law, then you are going to face your comeuppance. And in tragedy, uh, the crucial moment is the moment when the truth of this eternal law is revealed. And so whereas in comedy there's this kind of uh, malleability, there's a sense that actually if you have the right information, you can overcome any, any adversity. In tragedy, it's just the opposite, that you, you uh, come up against the truth, and when you fa face the truth, you're the wiser for it, uh, but often you end up dead, like um, somebody like Oedipus, who, and, you know, who kills his father, sleeps with his mother, uh, breaks two great, great laws in the sky, albeit without realising it. Uh, and there's no way back for him. That's a classic tragedy. And then the final story, the story of winter, is what Fry calls irony or satire. Uh, 
in irony, the audience can see something that the main characters can't see. There's always, in a sense, two dimensions to irony of what uh, is apparent to the participants and what can only be seen from the outside or perhaps seen later by the participants. So fundamental to irony is the characters themselves don't really know what story they're in, but their ignorance reflects on the story that the reader or the viewer of a drama can perceive. And satire is a kind of savage form of irony, uh, where not only are the characters ignorant, but they're ridiculed for their ignorance. And these are the four kinds of story. And in 1990, uh, when I was studying theology for the first time, I wrote a dissertation on Mark's gospel about whether Mark was uh, a comedy, uh, a, uh, a romance, a tragedy or an irony. And as you may remember, Mark's gospel doesn't have an ending. It ends in the middle of a sentence. Uh, they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid, talking about the women leaving the tomb. And so I reflected on the nature of the story, and I, I kind of went through the story as a comedy, I went through Mark's Gospel as a tragedy, as, as a romance, and finally concluded that it was, more than anything, an irony, where the reader could, of the Gospel could see things that the disciples and the women at the tomb and other key characters couldn't see, and that the, Mark's technique for drawing us into becoming disciples was to make us, in some sense, more knowledgeable and perceptive than the participants in the story themselves. Uh, and that also saw God, in some ways, as a character half in, half outside the story, who could shape the story while, it, while actually being a participant, obviously, in Jesus. So what's important there is not the, the precise details of comedy and tragedy and so on. I, I mean, one incidental detail is that irony and comedy is about the common people, whereas romance and tragedy is always about the upper classes. I mean, there's lots of observations, and I just found Fry's treatment of these things utterly fascinating, and that got me hooked on narrative. Uh, and as I say, that first dissertation I wrote, which I've never published, um, became the, the, the beginnings of my thinking about narrative. And then I came across something called uh, not narrative theology, but narrative ethics. This book was written in 1981, and as some of you will know, it was become one of the most influential books in philosophy in the latter part of the 20th century, after virtue by the Scottish-American philosopher Alistair MacIntyre. And in this book, it's a long book about many things, but he his thesis is really that we cannot solve our uh, ethical dilemmas today because we have no sense of the narrative of which we are, are a part. So narrative ethics, as it became known, it's not such a fashionable phrase now, but narrative ethics saw as the problem that we think we can make decisions based on ultimate ideas of right and wrong or calculations of what good consequences will be. And McIntyre rejects both of these. Uh, as being what another theologian called decisionist, that's to say focusing on the moment, as if in the moment you can make those sorts of decisions. McIntyre says you can't possibly make those kind of decisions unless you consider the whole narrative, the narrative of the history of how you came to be in this situation and the narrative of what you expect the future to look like, not just in the days to come, but in decades, centuries, eons to come. And so he, uh, he says in a wonderful phrase, we, uh, we can't answer the question of who we are unless we frame it as a, as a question of, of what stories do I find myself to be a part? Uh, and this has helped me understand, uh, for example, to take a very topical issue, uh, the difference between Trump and Biden in the American election. I'm not talking about the character of the two people. I'm talking about the way that they're telling profoundly different stories. Uh, Trump is telling a story of how every individual American can make a lot of money the way he can 
but to do so means being ruthless about excluding uh, elements in society that don't fall into his story and you know leaving aside the personal rhetoric and style of Trump the real issue it seems to me certainly for Christians with Trump is that he is telling too small a story a story that doesn't include most of God's children it only includes uh, certain people like him and it's a story profoundly based on resentment the people that seem most drawn to Trump's rhetoric are people who feel entitled to something that they've been robbed of by certain usually unnamed people at a certainly uh, at a certain slightly unspecific time in the more or less recent past that they did have something that every American should be entitled to and it's been stolen from them probably by the Democrats at some time a few years ago. We never get the details of that. But the point I'm making is that what Trump is telling is a compelling story. And in the end, his story proved more compelling than Hillary Clinton's story four years ago. Uh, and the question is, will it prove more compelling than Biden's story? Biden is telling, in my view, a much bigger story of America's place in the world, which affects things like its relationship with the planet that Trump doesn't seem to be too bothered about. Uh, he's telling a story about a bigger America that isn't basically largely for and about white people. Uh, it's certainly about women in a way that sometimes Trump's story seems to be mainly about men. Uh, it's about the whole diversity of God's children, disabled, uh, gay, uh, and, and all the things we associate with diversity, and most obviously at the moment, uh, African-American. It, it's a bigger story. And so the debate, it seems to me, between Trump and Biden is really about story and how big your story is and who that story includes. And the real question in America is, is the number of people who want to keep the story small, only including a certain number of people, bigger than the number of people who want to make the story big and who tell a bigger story of America that it has always been about the immigrant about the rejected person who makes it good in America. So those are the kinds of questions that, that McIntyre asks in this book, After Virtue, hold it up properly. Um, and that's where we really cross over from narrative into theology. So the next book that really matters was written two years, three years after After Virtue. And this is a really crucial book in understanding the place of narrative in theology, although I have to explain why. It's called The Nature of Doctrine, Religion and Theology in a Post-Liberal Age by George Lindbeck. And it was published, I think, in this country by SBCK. This is the American Yale, um, sorry, uh, John Knox Westminster Press version uh, that I got in the States, um, 1984. So what George Lindbeck famously does is he talks about three kinds of theology. What he talks about are, first of all, cognitive propositional theology. Again, don't worry about the long name. But that first kind of theology is, if you, if you like, a kind of naive theology that thinks of uh, the Bible in particular and doctrine in general as offering up more or less historical and scientific facts, propositions. This equals that. The world was made in seven days. Humanity was made the head of all the animals. And these kind of propositional facts. We will go to heaven if our sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus. These kinds of, this is propositional statements. Um, and that's, that's what he calls going. So it, it's really about us thinking the right things and following a certain kind of logic. And that's what you might call pre-modern theology. That's what people believed in, um, in the time probably before the Enlightenment. Um, and some people still do, of course. Um, then the second kind, kind of theology is what he calls experiential expressive. And experiential expressive is the, what the Enlightenment calls the turn to the subject. In other words, what happened in the 18th century is people... Well, this is philosophers, although that trickled down to most people today, stopped looking for wisdom, goodness and truth out there or up there in heaven 
and started looking for it in here, in my heart. That's called the turn to the subject, the subject being me and you. And what Limbeck calls experiential expressivism is a turn to uh, the same turn in theology. So theology stops being about what God does in heaven or what Jesus does in Palestine and becomes really about what the Holy Spirit does in my heart. Whether I have what are sometimes called religious experiences, uh, whether I feel close to God, whether I hear uh, an answer to my prayers. Theology is all about those things. Now, it's not that those weren't ever thought about and mentioned in the previous 17th centuries, but they really come on the agenda big time at the end of the 18th century, and they dominate the conversation at the beginning of the 19th century. And in many ways, that's where things have stayed. And the irony is... This is sometimes called a liberal approach because it's based on humanity rather than on God. But it's interesting to see how, for example, the charismatic movement has swallowed that hook, line and sinker. And so, so much of the charismatic movement is about my experiences, my speaking in tongues, my sense of healing, my, my ability to offer words of prophecy. So it's all a lot more complicated than the conservative liberal divide would make you think. Now, the point about all of this is there's a third kind of theology uh, that Lindbeck is recommending, and he calls that cultural linguistic. So those are the two words that do matter, culture and language, cultural linguistic. And what he's saying is that being a person of faith isn't about believing the right things or having certain experiences. It's fundamentally about the analogy of learning a language becoming part of a culture, uh, being enculturated into certain habits, learning to take the right things for granted. So somebody was recently telling me about a culture in Malaysia that they'd spent a lot of their life in, uh, where people didn't talk about death, they didn't speculate about life after death, but they did take four-year-old children to funerals. And so from the very beginning of their lives, children would be used to death, and in a sense, actions speak louder than words. You become enculturated into realising death is part of the human experience. It doesn't have to be a proposition saying there is life after death. It doesn't have to be an experience to say, I feel a sense of faith so strong that death doesn't worry me. It's actually a, a cultural habit. It's I, I go to funerals of everybody and I learn through being there. You could call it lived experience, to, to use a phrase that we use a lot in our disability conferences. Now, that sense of cultural linguistic theology, that sense that we're, we become part of a culture, of which obviously worship is a very significant part, uh, is where narrative comes in. Because in addition to, uh, to the habits of a community and the traditions of a community, we have the stories of that community. And anyone, and I imagine that's most of you, part of this seminar, who have grown up in a, in a family or an extended family will know that there is always grandfather who over the Christmas dinner always tells the same story about how he was young and if it hadn't been for that man who got him onto the boat, he would never have done this, that. Now everyone tails off because they've heard the story so many times before. And in a sense, religious communities are like that. We hear the story of Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. We hear the story of Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. We hear the story of the people meeting God in exile and being brought back by Ezra and Nehemiah. We hear the story of Jesus being born of Mary. We hear the story of him dying on the cross, rising from the dead. You know, we are shaped by these stories, often from a very early age we grew up in the faith. Um, and, and so the cultural linguistic approach uh, takes, uh, takes the view that these, that, and this is the crucial point, I guess, is it's not that we have a story of our own and we look at the Christian story and we say it, it connects with it quite a lot and expresses it quite beautifully, so I think I'll attach myself to that. It's the other way round, that we have an incoherent story and in baptism we become part of that bigger story, which is the Christian story, and we find ourselves within that story.
Now that takes me from Lindbeck's book to this book, The Peaceable Kingdom, written by Stanley Howas, actually a year before uh, Lindbeck's book, I think in 1983, uh, but you know, very much the same time as Lindbeck's book. And, and this is a crucial book, and it was a very crucial book for me. In fact, it was the first of all of these books, I think, that I read. Um, because Howas is very inf influenced in the 1970s, in the early part of his career, by the notion of story. He takes uh, McIntyre's idea that everything we do is part of a story and in fact making sense of our lives. If you think about going to see a therapist, what you're doing is taking a whole dot of elements in your life that you can't make sense of and the therapist is helping you form them into a coherent story that makes sense of the events that seemed just random and out of control in your life. So Howa starts off with that notion of story, but by the end of this book, he's really talking about a different kind of story, which is the Christian story, and about how our story, even with the best therapist, can, we can never really make sense of our story uh, unless we, in a sense, let go of our desire to make sense of our story and allow it to be folded within the Christian story. Um, and that brings me to uh, the last of my six books in this story of narrative theology, and that's my own book, uh, Improvisation. This is the second edition that was published a couple of years ago. The first edition was published in 2004. Uh, and what I try to do in Improvisation is take the whole conversation one step further. So uh, we've obviously, I've explored the different, the two kinds of story, what I sometimes call narrative from below, the sense that we all live in a story and we make sense of our lives by piecing together the different elements into a story. And what I sometimes call narrative above, that's to say that there is an overarching story, the story that in improvisation I describe as having five acts, creation, Israel, Jesus, the church, and heaven or eschaton. Uh, and that we're living in Act 4 of a five-act story. And then I go a step beyond that uh, and explore the way of what it means to live in Act 4. And in Act 4, we, just like Lindbeck's cultural linguistic approach, we become formed uh, in the habits and traditions and practices uh, of the Christian story. We... we immerse ourselves we saturate ourselves in the christian story that's what we do in worship every sunday and during the week that's what we do in prayer uh, that's what we do in being formed as disciples uh, and then we're so saturated in the christian story that rather than facing decisions here in act four we in fact f find that we learn to take the right things for granted and we hardly realise we're making a decision because it comes a matter of course to us. Uh, and then I talk about different kinds of improvisation. And the most significant one that I'm going to finish with now is to talk about what I call over-accepting. Uh, 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 in, in improvisation in a theatre, to accept is simply to, uh, to carry on the story, accepting the, the terms and conditions, the, the premises, if you like, on which the other characters in the drama are, are acting. So if, to, if someone says, bang, you're dead, and points their fingers at you in a gun shape, to accept would be to fall to the ground. To say, hang on, no, I'm not, there's no bullet there, um, that's not a real gun, I'm not dead, I'm carrying on living, is what's known as to block. Uh, but these aren't the only two options in life or in improvisation. There's a third and dynamic option, and that is called over-accepting. Over-accepting is to put the small story of your life within the larger story of the Christian narrative and allow it to be enfolded, uh, to be absorbed, to be out-narrated by, by the story. So to give an example, uh, in... Uh, Princess Diana, when she was asked by Martin Bashir in that interview in 1995, uh, will you ever be queen? She replied, perhaps queen of people's hearts. So what she was subtly saying, or perhaps unsubtly saying, was being queen of England or being queen of the United Kingdom is no big deal. What really matters is 
being queen of the whole world by being queen of people's hearts. That's over-accepting, that's placing it in a larger story. And what fascinates me is how this works, not, over, not just over and over in the Bible, where you see this pattern of over-accepting uh, demonstrated. So to, most obviously, Jesus doesn't block the cross, he doesn't passively accept the cross, he over-accepts the cross and is resurrected on the other side of the cross. He fits his suffering and death into the larger story of what God is doing in the world. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what I, I see that pattern not just over and over again in the scriptures, but I see it presenting itself over and over again in the way Christians respond to the challenges we see in the world. So the most obvious example would be the pandemic. We can't block the pandemic. It's, it's bigger and more powerful than we are. Uh, we, can't, we could passively accept the pandemic and in a sense just try and sit this out and keep away from infection for the next year or so until this is resolved with a vaccine or however it's res resolved. Um, but surely we would all want to over-accept the pandemic and see it as a, as a, a refiner's fire that, that demonstrates to us what's most important about our life, what's most important about the church, what's most neglected and most vital about society. That's to over-accept the pandemic. And so to conclude, uh, uh, the, you can probably tell where I'm going with all of this, when we're talking about the narrative of disability, Clearly, the, there are a number of narratives that are told about disability. There's a, there's a medical narrative that's usually about seeing things as being wrong with people. Uh, there's a social narrative that says, in a sense, disability is entirely in the eye of the beholder. Um, there, uh, but I, I would incline us, since I believe we're all disabled uh, in different ways, to see our story as one that can be over-accepted. So that's to say we don't block disability either by trying to prevent disability, trying to so-called heal it, as some people say. Um, neither do we simply accept disability and say we all have our cross to bear, if you like. Uh, I, w I would suggest we over-accept disability by saying I have been made this way um, because God wants one like me I have a unique task to perform in God's kingdom like every kind of vocation it takes a while to work out what that is and again like every kind of vocation it may not be the one that we would choose and yet there is perfect peace in finding our place in the story and realizing what part we have to play a part alongside other people no one gets to play a part that doesn't need anybody else. Uh, and it can be for some of us that it's in our neediness that we most profoundly realise our, our, our part in the story. I hope that portrayal of disability brings together, in a sense, the sense of narrative as piecing together the disparate and often unconnected parts of our lives in a coherent story, but also the sense of narrative that sees the narrative of Israel Jesus and the church all the way from creation to the end of the world in heaven as being the definitive story and when we find our place in that story we find true joy. I hope these thoughts are helpful as you begin your seminar.